Hi, Julia. Hi, Evan. I'm going to let that poll go. I'm going to actually, I'm going to end the poll so that you can see the results, Zoe. Check that out. Um, and I want to welcome everybody to our December installment of Backcountry Beta. This is an event the coalition does in collaboration with True Gear. I'm Jen Gorecki. I'm the CEO of Coalition Snow. Um, and I'm really happy that everybody is here tonight. Thanks for taking time to join us. Um, Catherine and I created Backcountry Beta last night, last night, <laughs> last year, uh, because we saw that there was this huge interest um, for people to learn more um, about the backcountry. And while this is in no way, absolutely not any replacement for formal backcountry training, which everybody should have that before you head out into the backcountry, we recognize that there's resource sharing that we can do that um, can help people pursue that sport. Um, and also, I'd say that almost everything that we talk about in, um, is kind of relevant to the resorts too, particularly if you're in the side country. So hopefully there's a little something for everyone here. Um, we hold these events on the first Wednesday of every month. And I believe if I remember correctly, but also I don't have a memory anymore, so don't hold me to it. I believe Claire Smallwood from She Jumps is going to be our next guest in January. So um, make sure to check that out. We will be posting a recording of this in the clubhouse. Um, so if you miss anything, you can go back to that. And this might be one of the one of the events that you will want to watch over and over again, because Zoe's here with us tonight and we're going to be learning exercises that will keep our bodies ideally not getting hurt or keep us from getting hurt. I th exercising is hard for me. Let's just be honest. Like, I don't know what Zoe's going to have us do tonight. We're going to be out of our seats. Like there might be maybe some running in play. I don't know. Are we, are we going to do jumping jacks, push-ups? Oh, so none of the bad exercises. Okay, great. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over um, to Zoe, who's going to introduce herself, and then she's going to kick us off. I do kick us off to get started. I did mute everyone, but know that if there's something that you'd like to say or ask, like, feel free to pop it into the um, comments. Um, also, feel free to unmute yourself and put your video on and ask. I just um, try to keep everyone muted so that we don't have weird video stuff. So, Zoe, I'm going to turn it over to you if you can unmute yourself because you are muted. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, everybody. My name is Zoe. I am a physical therapist and I run Outdoor Women's Wellness. It's a online virtual healthcare for outdoor women. And I started this just because I had so many friends ask me questions and call me and FaceTime me and say, what's going on with my knee or what's going on with my ankle. And I really loved helping athletes in particular and uh, people who love outdoor sports. So I started, I started my company. Um, and backcountry snowboarding is close to my heart. So I this just combines my favorite passion with my profession, and it's really fun to talk about for me. So please ask questions throughout if you have any, um, and use the chat or unmute yourself. I'll, I will stop periodically for questions just through sections. I'll try not to go too deep into the anatomy and phys. I can sometimes go on little tangents, but I'll, I'll try my best to, to avoid those and uh, get to the fun stuff. And Quick question. Um, so everyone, as I saw, a lot of people were kind of throughout the board, new to the backcountry, um, intermediate, a couple advanced people, but a, mainly in the new to, to intermediate range. And so I think that's a really great place for this program tonight. And I hope everyone has gets some really good information to take away from this too. But to start out, uh, we're going to just dive a little bit into the anatomy and phys, just because I'll be referencing two terms quite a bit. One is your anterior chain and one is your posterior chain. So the anterior chain is typically we're talking about the front of our bodies, our anterior side. And with that, th that makes up our abdominals, which we actually have four different abdominal muscles. So if you think of just the six pack, there are lots more to that. And we'll get into that a little bit. 
And then our hip flexors, which make up our rectus femoris, iliacus, and our psoas muscle. So I know big terms and, but anterior chain, front of the body, we'll start there. And our posterior chain makes up the back of our body. So we're going to be talking about the hamstrings, glutes. And remember you have three of those too. Those are our butt muscles, our uh, multifidi and our paraspinals. So that is our posterior chain. When it comes to touring, we really actually want to make sure we're using both our anterior and posterior chain. And we want to make sure there's a balance between the two. Newer Newer backcountry skiers and riders tend to use more of just their anterior chain. And this can lead to a big imbalance and also a lot of soreness. Um, uphill training is a big piece of touring too, because we are no longer taking the nice lift ride up to ride back down. We, we have to work for the turns. And so when you're going uphill, it's not just like hiking. You have your skis or board attached to your feet. You have boots, sometimes you have crampons and you have a lot more clothing and gear in your bag. You should have all of your AVI gear, water, snacks, lots of snacks. Um, and this makes you a lot heavier than you are just hiking. And if it's a powder day, you're also breaking trail <laughs> and working really, really hard to earn those turns. So you have a lot more weight and this usually leads to people using that anterior chain a lot more. And so if you think of one thing, for those of you who have had experience in the backcountry, and feel free to type it in the chat. What is the thing that you usually hear people complain about the most body part or area in your body from touring? Feet, yes, that's a good one. Feeds, feeds, <laughs> lots of feet. Um, does anyone usually hear about the front of their hips, their hip flexors? Does anyone ever have, yes, I get a yes, hip flexors, quads. So I would say the one thing I hear the most, and from myself too, especially early season when I'm just getting back into it, are massage clients, yes, hip flexor pain. So a lot of times the number one complaint is hip flexors. And this is because we tend to overuse those hip flexors to pick up our leg, to, to make one more step forward and up, right? Not just forward, but going up. And we just really overuse that hip flexor motion instead of relying more on that posterior chain. And so hip flexors, number one, commonly overloaded injury. And we're going to talk about how to avoid overloading those hip flexors in a little bit with some exercises as promised. And the second one that I get the most of feet is one thing, but usually a lot of times that is a, one of the things we don't have much control over. Um, I mean, trying to keep your feet warm and dry is one thing, extra socks, but getting used to just miles and getting, getting your legs back under you is going to help a lot with that too. But the other one I see on injury wise is low back pain from clients. And I would say that would be the number two most common injury or pain that I, I see. And with tight hip flexors, and usually these two things kind of go together when you're, and I'm going to show you this just, and I'll stand up. Um, like I said, so PT, we just make people move all the time. This is, this is what we do, but so your hip flexors are here. So when you're always trying to just pick up your foot to, to move, you're really working that hip flexor. When you get really tight in the front of the hip, it causes your, your hips to pull forward. If you can see that increased curve here in my back. So from here, and then pulling my hip forward. And that actually causes an increased stress right to the, right to my low back here. And that can lead to some of your low back pain too, because those hip flexors are pulling you forward from being tight and irritated. The other thing that can lead to low back pain is also a lack of abdominal stability. Like I said, four muscles in your abdomen. Crunches do not cut it at all. So if you're like, okay, I need to do my core exercises. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do my crunches and it's gonna be good. Has anyone heard of your transverse abdominus? Exciting muscle. 
Yep. Oh, cool. Awesome. I love it. I think this is one of the most underrated muscles and it's also one of my favorite muscles to talk about and train, but this muscle it's so transverse. It goes this way. Instead of like when we think of our six pack muscles and all our six pack muscles go up and down. Right. And that's our rectus abdominis, but our transverse abdominis actually goes around and it goes all the way to your spine in the back. And it is such an important muscle for spine and low back stability. Also for your hips too. It gives you a lot of stability for your hips. And so we'll, we'll get to that one, but that one is so, so crucial to train. So you might need to think about changing up your core routine after tonight. And the last thing with low back pain too, is that just the added weight. So your bag probably weighs <laughs> or start one. Yes. That is <laughs> starting a good strength program. We'll, we'll get to that. Strength is so important. Um, but the last thing too, is just a heavy bag, right? So, uh, in the, in the back country, you have, like I said, your back country gear, Abby gear, layers, water snacks. And if you have in, instabilities, it's going to intensify them. So being strong, without a pack is really important, but being able to maintain that strength when you have a heavy pack and you're riding, right? So I, I, I snowboard. Um, but when I'm riding, I need to have that good core control, having a heavier bag as I'm riding. So I'm not just kind of whipping myself around and can cause some pain to my low back. So skinning tips and tricks, and we'll get into the exercises too. So for this is going to be mainly more for the newer, newer backcountry skiers and riders. Um, but these are kind of the do's and don'ts. And I've just picked up four that I wish I knew when I first started, because I think I've, I'm guilty of doing all of these when I first started writing. And the first one is don't pick up your ski to progress forward. Um, your skins are uh, that you put on the bottom of your ski they catch going backwards, but when you glide your ski, it's, it, it's a nice smooth glide. But if you try to pick up your ski to set it back down, you're picking up that weight every single time. And that's really going to tire out your hip flexor super fast. I remember when I first started skinning and if anyone else or backcountry touring, if, if anyone else has done this too, maybe it was just me. But I remember I was just trying to like move, like I hiked, right. Just like picking up each step at the beginning. And I, I, I couldn't like move my legs the next day. I was so tired. So make sure you are gliding your ski along the snow. It's going to take a lot of the weight off your hip flexors and it, it's just going to feel better on your hip overall. The next one is, um, don't try to, to only pull your leg forward to advance on the trail. And this is, this one takes a little bit to, don't pick up your skin before. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so the second one, don't try to pull your leg forward to progress. And what I mean by that, and again, I'll, I'll stand up to show you. And if you want to stand up with me and do these, feel free. These aren't the exercises yet, but I think it can be helpful. We'll get there. Um, but so when you're trying to progress and you're, you're like pulling your leg forward, I can use my hip flexor to pull forward but I can actually also use my opposite glutes and my, my posterior chain. So if I wanna pull forward, I can actually activate here to bring my leg up without using the front of my hip flexor. These muscles are a lot stronger than these muscles. So if you can utilize your posterior chain more, it's gonna take the stress off of this. And this, I know this is kind of a hard concept to get, but this next exercise that we're gonna do in a moment is going to make it make a lot more sense. Okay. Number three is try not to take really big steps and, or use momentum to drive your back leg forward on steeper terrain. So a lot of times we'd kind of just throw our leg forward or take a really big step up. And then we have to really work almost like a single leg squat to push yourself up. But if you just try to take smaller steps, um, it's, it's going to help you keep your core more engaged too. When you take bigger steps or like throw your body onto the next step, you're losing that stability 
if you can really control it well with your body, if you have really good single leg control, it's, it'll be easier, but a lot of times we end up doing things to compensate and get our body up onto that step. So controlling that, taking a little bit of smaller steps and is going to help give you more core engagement and more um, trunk control. Oh, and yep. Yeah, and so smaller steps, I said that. And so it doesn't, this doesn't really apply to flat train though, just as a heads up flat train, you can kind of get that gliding motion and you get a good rhythm going if there's not a ton of snow and you're not breaking trail. And so more so on a steep terrain. Okay. If there's any questions on the do's and don'ts, I'm going to get into some of the prehab exercises next. I have a question, Zoe. Yeah. Always, I'm a split boarder as well. And I feel, and I tend to always go out with skiers and I feel so clunky compared to them. Um, so I'm curious if you think that there's a difference in any sort of technique or like things that we should be doing, you know, like muscle wise, like on a split board versus skis, or is it just more getting used to your equipment? Cause all my ski, all my backcountry skier friends look really graceful. And I'm like the one who's weird on my split board. Also it a hundred percent could just be me. I'm open to that. It just, no. Me. So if you think about it too, split boards are just like the design and everything of a split board is different. And typically they're going to be wider. So you're going to have to make the skin track a little bit wider too, if you're behind skiers. So you're getting more resistance even as you're going up, um, even like the tips of your, your snowboard going out, like usually catches, I noticed this at least when I'm out, but like, I know if there's been a skier setting the track in front of me because it's like slightly too narrow and I'm trying to widen it, which creates more work for me too. Also the edge control is different, which makes side hilling, um, a lot harder and our boots are a lot softer unless you ride in a hard boot. Um, being in, in soft boots, there are some advantages. It's way more comfortable, um, in my opinion. And, but by the end of the day, um, or not by the end of the day, end of the day feels good compared to a skier. Sometimes I used to ski, so I've been on both sides. Um, but when you're side hilling, you lose a lot of stability. So where you have like a really, um, soft boot and in finding something inter intermediate, I would recommend like more on, on the firmer side of a boot can help a lot with feeling more control. But when you're in a soft boot and you're on a steep terrain, trying to, to dig in and like keep that edge down is just a lot harder to do. So I am with you. I, I feel a lot less efficient on my slip board than I did when I, when I used to backcountry ski. Um, but riding down on a good powder day, nothing can quite, quite beat it. I'm sure that can start a little bit of an argument, but I'm a little biased. That's okay. We're, we, we, we can have that debate. We have um, one other question in the comments here around tips on sidestepping uphill. Yes. So, um, you know, get good at your kick turns practice your kick turns. If you don't, do you know what a kick turn is? You can, if, if someone says yes or no, I can, I can try to um, verbally explain it. It might be interesting, but demo. Okay. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to demo standing, I'm going to try to verbally demo. And then if it gets to the point, I'll try to maybe demo. We'll see. I am only drinking LaCroix. So Maybe not tonight. <laughs> um, so when a, a kick turn is, so when you're hiking and you're on steep terrain, it, you, you know the, how there's switchbacks when you're on really steep mountain terrain. So same thing in the back country. If you're on really steep terrain, you'll need to at some point turn the opposite way. Um, and so you have to do a, a switchback just like you would hiking, but it's not, an, you, you're, you have these long sticks attached to your feet. So it makes turning to go the opposite direction a little bit tricky. Um, so what you have to do with this one, and I'm gonna use my hands as skis. So <laughs> bear with me because this is probably not the best demo. Um, but as you come up and you're, you're ready to switch directions, you have to move your ski out pretty much at a 90 degree angle to get going the opposite way. And from here, you have to pick up this ski, bring it to match. I remember you're on pretty steep terrain here and it's, it's a hard, it's a hard skill to get down. 
Um, but actually one of the things that I feel works the best is working on that posterior chain to do it. So when, and I have a small demo video of this somewhere, I'll, maybe I'll find it and send it to Jen and you can, you can tag it in. I think I made one last ski season, but it's been a while since I've played in snow, so I can't quite remember. Um, and so with this, when you're making that, so I will demo, here you go. And so you're facing this way, you're making a big step opening up to face the other direction. When I bring this leg over, if I lean forward and use my posterior chain, I can lean, activate my butt muscle to pull up. And if I'm keeping my toe up, my ski actually will drop down, pointing my tip of my ski up in the air versus down. And a lot of people try to pull with their hip flexor to bring their leg over, but sometimes that can cause your hip or not your hip, your, the front of your ski or snowboard to dig into the snow and then you feel stuck. Um, I know we've all been there. <laughs> I've definitely been there. And so working on that posterior chain and actually trying to activate that glute to pull yourself up can help bump the, the front of your ski up in the air to bring it over instead of digging it deeper into the snow. Will you show that one more time? That was really, that was nice to see. Will you do that one more time? Yeah, yeah. sorry you can't see my feet. Um, oh, there we go. So if I'm facing this way and I want to turn this way, I'm going to, so pick up this leg and I'm going to bring it over to that 90 degree angle. And remember, you don't want your skis crossing in the back here. Make sure that you're not crossing because, or you're not going to be able to lift up this leg. Then when I transition over, I'm putting all of my weight in, in this leg, the direction I want to move in. And as I transition all my weight over, I'm squeezing my glutes working on my butt muscle, tipped forward, turning, and then bringing my leg down. And you can get a slight knee bend too, but you're not just trying to like only use your, your hip. If you, if you can use that posterior chain, you can actually bring that ski in with less difficulty. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. I'm glad the demo worked. There is a demo in snow, which probably will make it a little bit make more sense. So I'll try to get that to you guys. Okay. I've been moving. I'm warm. It's your turn to also get warm with me. Uh, so exercises for backcountry. I picked out one, two, three, four exercises that are kind of my favorites and my go tos. When it comes to training for backcountry, don't just start training when the snow is here. Training starts last month. Um, really, I mean, I, I, the stronger you can get yourself in the off season as you prepare, the you're going to reduce your risk of injury. You're going to feel more solid when you get back on the snow, um, and you're just going to be stronger overall. Um, does anyone have a strength routine that they'd like to do already? Maybe. Yeah. Awesome. Sweet. Sweet. Strength training is so, so important. Um, and, and lifting and, and there's different ways. Body, body weight can be a great way to train. If you have access to a gym, I also have some TheraBands that I have as demos today. TheraBands, I think are a fabulous tool for exercise because they fit into any bag. They, you don't need gym access to get to them, but these can kick your ass. Don't get me wrong. You can set up a really good exercise routine, even just with bands, um, and, and things that you have around your house for weight. If you have access to a gym that that can be nice. Cause you can add more weight. Typically, if you have access to like a squat rack or kettlebells, dumbbells, things like that. But there are things that you can do now that you could totally kick your butt at home if that's what you have access to, too. So everything I'm gonna talk about is things that you can do at home and you can always just add weight or resistance at the gym if you have access to that as well. So the first one, 
depending on the chair you're sitting on, you might not want to step up on it. If your chair has wheels, please do not step up on it. Um, <laughs> uh, so the first one is step ups. Step ups, I think, are just a great exercise to start strengthening your legs. Um, a chair at home, a bench at the gym, there's, you, you got options. A stump at the park, a picnic table. I mean, there's lots of options for this. I would recommend adding weight um, to, to your back, similar, either heavier, I would go heavier than what you normally do for your backcountry bag. So, um, even like 30 pounds is a great place to be and just work on repetition. Stair steppers work really well for this too, but I think having just free, not, not on a machine or a stair stepper, just on to a bench with weight on your back, just like you would is the best way to practice. Uh, research shows that the most, the most beneficial way to exercise is making it as specific to the activity you're trying to do, right? So doing a step ups with weight on your back, that's pretty dang specific to backcountry touring. You're just doing step up after step up after step up. So with this one, I have a solid, solid chair. So if you're not on a solid chair, you can do, um, you can either do some, well, we're going to do those in a little bit. You can either watch, pretend, find a chair. Um, but with this one, you really want to make sure that you're able to control the motion. You don't want to be jumping up and using momentum off your back leg. You want to make sure that you're able to control the motion up and control all the way back down to tapping the ground. If you feel like you have to hop or jump or you land heavy, you're going to need to find a lower, a lower um, bench to step up onto. And then, so with this one, adding additional weight, increasing the height it, to make it harder, to make it easier, lower, lower it down. So if you have to use momentum, you should definitely lower it down because you're not controlling it fully. You want to make sure your muscles are in full control. And then no weight would be another way to make it easier. Next one. So this one, I'm going to use a resistance band for. And you can get these from Amazon. You can get them probably at your local um, store, even in like the workout section at, at um, just general stores can work really well too. But these ones are called crab walks. And I would recommend doing it with a resistance band because it adds a lot of extra force on your hips. And so with this one, and I hope everyone's doing this. I can't see everyone's pictures, but I'm hoping that I'm not the only one getting up and moving around. I probably am. Everyone's tired from a long day of work or play. Um, so for this one, going around your ankles, if your ankles are too hard or if you, um, if you've had previous knee pain and this causes any knee pain, move it up to above your knees. And so for this one, around, around the ankles, you're gonna kind of do a mini squat and you're gonna sidestep. So pushing out slowly back in. So if you notice with my upper body too, I'm not just leaning over to, to advance my hip, I'm controlling the motion with my hip. Also not letting the band bring, come in fast, nice and controlled motion. And this one, after you do about 10, 15 steps in each direction, you're gonna feel the burn in the sides of your hips. And this is really good for those long days touring, strengthening your glute medius, which is one of the most important hip muscles when you're on a single leg. So I can ask you a question. I might've missed this because I ran to my kitchen real fast to get a chair so that I could do that exercise. And then also I did turn my video off, but with that um, band that you're using right now, yeah. Is it, is it a certain, the bands are different flexes, aren't they? Uh -huh. so do yeah. you recommend a certain flex in the bit? Like, can you just buy any band or is it like, what, it, what type of band should we get? So a lot of times, and I can also add this to like the notes for this is, but they usually come in a set and they have different resistances. So I would recommend getting a set because also you can use like a lighter resistance around your ankles and a heavier one around your knees, which can make it extra difficult and fun or too harder resistance, or you can even double them up. 
Um, so they come in a set. I typically use the, band, the brand TheraBand because it's what I use in the clinic and it's what I use with all of my clients as well. And I send everyone bands who needs them to if, with your programs. Next one is a hip flexor with band. And this is one to work the hip flexor. But remember, it's still important to keep the hip flexor strong, but we don't want to just focus on the hip flexor. We want to focus on the posterior chain too, but it's still important to strengthen the hip flexor. So again, I'm going to use the band for this one, but this one you can do without a band and just focus on the balance portion of it too. Um, so everyone, I'll have everyone stand up. I should have made everyone turn on their videos so I could watch everybody do these exercises. <laughs> and so for this one, I'm going to put the band around my feet. But if, if you don't have a band at home, you're going to just do it without. And it'll also just be a balance exercise. And you're going to work on driving your knee up into the air, keeping it straight, keeping your torso upright. So make sure you're not leaning to one side or the other, slowly lowering back down and doing the other side. Driving up slowly back down. And again, with the resistance band, this usually gets some good work. Also just for single leg balance, it's kind of a nice thing to work on. If you've had any recent injuries, it can also messes with your balance a little bit for that one too. Nice. All right. Last one of this series is the resisted hip extension. So this is where we're talking about the hip hinge and for those who have done like a single leg RDL um, or Romanian deadlift, this is one of my favorite exercises is an RDL. Um, and so with this one, um, this is really working the posterior chain and you wanna make sure your back is staying nice and flat with this one. And you're gonna hinge from your hip and I'm on one leg. So you're gonna hinge from your hips one leg is going to come back into the air, keeping your back nice and flat, and then coming back into a standing position. And with this one, it is very important to keep your back flat. Um, don't let yourself curve through your spine. You don't want to have back problems with this one. Jen, nice job. Just try to go a little further if you can and dip down and you'll feel it. And then as you pull back up, make sure you feel like you're pulling with your hamstring and your glute. Nice. And with this one too, I like to add the band again. So adding a band around your ankles. So as you're leaning back, you're pushing back against the band using even more of your posterior chain. Nice. Try not to roll your hip on that last one. Yeah, no, no hip popping. Any questions on those four exercises? Sweet. Awesome. Oh, people turn their cameras on. Yeah. Nice. Love it. Okay. Um, so we'll have a little more chat and then we'll do one more round of exercises at the end. And we'll talk about knees in specifically because um, you probably all know someone who has hurt their knee skiing or snowboarding. Um, I personally have, and I also know lots of people who have but um, we'll, we'll get there. So the one thing I want to talk about, and this is a really big difference between resort and backcountry, and this is the cardio portion of it. Strength training is really important in keeping yourself strong, but also your aerobic capacity is very, very important. Yeah, blew my whole no. Yeah, so skiing, knee injuries, yes, we will get there. Um, and so with heart rate zones, I love heart rate zone training personally. I think it's a great way. And this, I use heart rate zone training for backcountry programs, for um, runners from, you know, 5Ks to ultras. I use it with my mountaineering athletes. I think it's just, it's so important to, to, being a part of your program, especially if you want to have do well on those long tours where you're not bonking by the end. And so has anyone heard of aerobic capacity before? Maybe fun. Yes. Oh, wow. 
do we have a lot of people in healthcare? This is this is great. <laughs> um, so aerobic capacity. This is your oh yeah, sweet. This is awesome. Um, so this is where your body is just using oxygen to, to perform. And so this is typically your zone one of your heart rate zone. And some of these heart rate zones are different depending on the source that you get them from. This is, these are the zones that I, how I break them up for my, my athletes. Um, but so zone one is 55 to 75% of your max heart rate. Um, you can find your max heart rate by doing 220 minus your age. And that gives you a very rough estimate. I mean, it, there's no other component, so it's, it's small, but that's how you can get an idea of your heart rate zones without going and doing a stress test somewhere, which is also nice. And, um, your zone one is just being able to nose breathe. So just being able to breathe through your nose the entire time you should be able, this is a conversation pace. Um, you should be able to talk and maintain nose breathing. If anyone runs and I, before I started training heart rate zones for myself, I used to do this a lot where anytime I did cardio, I just pushed to the point where I was sweating a lot and feeling like I was working hard. I wasn't pushing like as hard as I could. I wasn't doing full out sprints, but I just felt like I was getting a good workout. And what I was actually training was like my, my no man zone. I wasn't getting any benefit to my aerobic capacity. In fact, it was actually just getting smaller and I wasn't really gaining much improvement in my anaerobic capacity. And so with that, I, I would just like still would bonk on skin tracks or just get out of breath and not being able to do long tours, um, and, or running because I just got too tired. <laughs> So yes, you should not. And if you feel like if I just explained to you, if you train that way, like if you're running or on the elliptical treadmill and you just push to the point where you're like, you're just breathing heavy, but you're not training zones. And like I said, that's all I used to do. Cause I was like, okay, I have 20 minutes. I'm just going to try to do a hard workout and, and then go home or, um, and I realized I wasn't really giving myself any benefit. And so heart rate zones was actually originally developed in the eighties for schema racing, fun fact. And because there's so very, so much variability in that event that they didn't know how to track the intensity or the work because it wasn't like a 400 meter run or something like that. So they actually started to use heart rate zones and it'd be, it be, we can't be, we came to get be a really useful tool for developing intensities and getting instant feedback. And it was portable, right? You can do this anywhere. And so you can actually, don't tell us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so with aerobic capacity, you can actually grow your aerobic capacity, your zone one. If you look at endurance athletes, they don't even, they barely even have a zone two or three because they have grown their zone one to be this huge zone and where they're only using oxygen to produce the energy that they need to perform. And so if you can train that, if there's a way to train that and actually grow that zone, it's going to make you so, so much better on the ski track with hiking. And it's, it's a really great way to to train. And in, in my opinion, and, and again, it's like now with fitness trackers and even just thinking of nose breathing, if you're maintaining nose breathing, then you're likely in zone one. So even if you don't have like a fitness tracker or something to be able to see your heart rate, it, those just like the talk tests and things like that, the breathe, the, how you're breathing is a great indicator of what zone you're in. And so we want to avoid going into that, the anaerobic zones too quickly. And an anaerobic capacity is when your body is breaking down glucose to, for energy. And so if anyone has ever bonked, um, where you just kind of feel like you hit a wall when you're out, whether it's in the backcountry, running, biking, um, it's usually because you're, you might be undernourished, but also if you're, if your body's just using up all this glucose 
it's you're you're going to hit that wall a lot faster but if you can grow that aerobic capacity you're actually just going to be using oxygen a lot longer before you have to dip into that anaerobic tank and start using the fuel for that and so a big takeaway from that is harder doesn't always mean better so if you're working to train this aerobic zone or aerobic capacity, you might have to go a lot slower than you think at the beginning. The, when I first started training my, my aerobic capacity, I could barely run up a hill. I had to walk every hill because my heart rate would go too high. My aerobic capacity was so small because I haven't been training it that I like, I couldn't go up any little hill still running. And when I, and on my runs and when I started working on it, I could run all of the hills, still maintaining nose breathing in my, in my zone. Um, and I did not feel tired after my run. I was, I was tired from more so the duration after like a two or three hour run than the intensity of the run. And that was a really cool feeling for me because I, I, I felt and I saw the difference in my runs. So, but remember, if you are going to start doing this, it is a frustrating process if you haven't done this before, or if you're, if you're not keeping track of those heart rate zones. So be patient. It will be worth it in the end, but the beginning part can definitely be frustrating. And when it is really frustrating, when you feel like you can barely run, or you're just like barely hiking and your, your heart rate is starting to spike a little bit, it's, it's called an aerobic deficiency. So where you just haven't been using that zone. So that don't zone really starts to not exist anymore. Any questions on heart rate zones? I have so much more information, but I'm gonna try not to get into um, levels of like blood lactate today. <laughs> Sweet. Going to start doing that. Yes, highly, highly recommend it. And especially if you like other endurance related sports, if you are hiking or, um, like to do, like to climb, or I, I do a lot of alpine climbing in the summer. So really big approaches to climbs. I, this helps me year round in the activities that I love. Okay. Fun stuff. Knees. So if people have more questions on heart rate zones, feel free to let me know. I can talk about it for way too long, um, and still be excited about it. So uh, but to the knees. So if you've known someone, I personally have torn my ACL backcountry skiing. Um, oh, so when we train zones by staying in zone one, so you can still train your other zones, but if you're trying to train your aerobic capacity, you want to stay in your zone one. And that is the percentage of your heart rate max. So your zone one is 55 to 75% of heart rate max. And heart rate max is your a is what minus your age two twenty minus two twenty minus your age. So you want to stay in fifty to seventy five percent of two twenty minus your age. Yes, and for everyone who came to this live version tonight, um, if you give me your email before it is over, I will email you my whole copy of everything I'm talking about tonight, so you have it to to look at for future reference too. So if you're trying to take notes, you can have, and you'll have all of my ridiculous notes on all the zones and what they mean because zones are, heart rate zones are great. Okay, knees. So I have personally torn my ACL backcountry skiing um, and I'm sure you, or you've known someone who has hurt their knees and it's so important to, to make sure you're protecting your knees. Depending on your, your sex too. So if you, if, if you're female um, and your anatomy actually puts you at greater likelihood for knee injuries. So uh, typically your pelvis is going to be wider and you're going to have a greater Q angle. And what a Q angle means is that the, it's the relation of your hip to the angle that your femur and that's your thigh bone comes down to. So, uh, your, so 
this angle that my femur comes down, the angle, if I were to draw a straight line down and then where my femur comes down, this is called your Q angle. So if you have wider hips, this is going to increase that Q angle and that can put you at greater risk of, of knee injury. And so, and also our AC, like ACLs are smaller in circumference. And so we really wanna make sure that we're strengthening our knees and preventing knee injuries to happen. It is so, so, so important. And so this is where early season strength training really comes into play. Um, another thing to think about too, if you're a skier is the setting on your dens. Um, so you can, if you're coming back from, I just I actually just finished working with someone who had an ACL injury about a year ago and they're trying to get back into skiing this upcoming season. And we talked about even just the den setting of keeping it in, and she's a more beginner intermediate skier and her, her binding didn't eject. And that's what led to her, her tear. So making sure that you have the right setting on your dens is really important to make sure your ski is going to release when it needs to release. Um, I don't remember den settings at all. Talk to your local ski shop on that. Make sure that it's the right fit for you. But it's a when you get your bikes, your bikes, when you get your your skis or your your skis turned up, tuned up, make sure to just check and that your den setting is good and matching on both sides. And one thing about that, Zoe, it's a it's a combination of your height, weight, age, and skier type. Mm -hmm. And the when you go and you get like if a shop does it for you, they're going to have to go off the chart that the binding manufacturer recommends. Um, and so they can't, and so every single binding has their own chart and they tend to be about the same, but it's a liability thing. So sometimes um, it's worth, you know, looking at the chart yourself or maybe understanding what goes in into it. Cause many times people might actually go in and they might decide, well, I want this to be a little bit tighter or I want it to be a little bit looser, but know that your shop is going to set it explicitly for like what that chart says, like per liability stuff. And that's the combo of it. Good to know. Good yeah, to and, know. And Vanessa's right. Like if you tell them intermediate versus expert, you'll get a lower din. If you tell them expert, like, cause all of that impacts the chart. Right. Yeah. And so just and I'm definitely not the person to ask on the settings. Thank you for chiming in. Um, and so, but make sure you do, you talk to someone or have it set that is going to be, or talk to somebody that you know, who's more advanced and knows a lot about it. Talk to Jen uh, <laughs> and, and find a good setting for you just to prevent those knee injuries from happening. Okay. So we have three more exercises today um, for you guys. And these we are all going to do together, hopefully. Let's see, make it gallery mode so I can see. Oh, no one's cameras are on. Um, so we're going to do these ones together. And the first one we're going to do is a split squat. So split squats, I really enjoy. And these ones, we're going to use the chair again. And this is where you're going to kick one leg up onto the chair behind you. And then you're going to squat. You might need a little extra room. Let me get this. Oh, oh boy. There we go. And then you're going to squat down in this position, pushing back up. Um, I really like single leg control. We do a lot on a single leg when it comes to, to touring and our knees. Um, we're, yes, we're more powerful here, but we need to make sure that we have strength and stability on a single leg. One of the great things with this one is you can add weight to make it harder. You can stand on an unstable surface with your down leg, like a piece of foam or on a softer blanket can also give you good instability, um, to make it harder to stabilize and balance. Do you have to keep your knee from going past your toes? Great question. So um, you've probably heard a lot of information about never let your knees go past your toes. And if you walk downstairs, your knee goes past your toes and it's okay. So um, with this one, you can have it go past a little bit. 
you can have it, you can change it, you can make it so it doesn't. Um, if you're having knee pain, you probably don't want it to go past your toes because when you go past your toes, it adds a little bit of extra load across the top of the kneecap. Um, but we do a lot of things in life that where our knee goes past our toes. So we're not going to stop every, all the things we do in day-to-day -day life, just to make sure our knee never goes past our toes. So it's okay to work on that a little bit too. All right, exercise number two is a lateral lunge, so side lunges. And no chair for this one. And so this is where take a step out to the side, lunging into it. And this one, you wanna make sure that your knee is staying in line with your second toe. So not necessarily forward or backwards, but in line. And what I mean by that is you don't want your knee to fall inward to your big toe. You wanna make sure that your knee is staying over the top of your second toe. And again, weight is a great thing to add with this one too. I love seeing everyone exercising. This is great. We even have group exercise over there. I love it. So are you making sure that your heels are lined up in that? So like when you take the step, are both your heels lined up or what's the placement of your feet? Does it matter? Um, so try to have your, your toes facing forward. Um, but if they're not perfectly lined up, that's fine. Yeah. Just as long as you're stepping to the side, if, it, if they're so far apart where then you're stepping forward, then you're kind of changing the exercise a little bit, but we move in multi-directions. So changing it up and even like stepping out to the side or stepping slightly backwards, like all of that is good. Mix it up, give it variety. All right, last one. This is called the monster walk. This one I use with the band again. Um, Again, I just, I like bands because they're easy. They're easy to travel with and they can make a hard workout um, harder really quickly. So this one band around your ankles and, and you can do the motion if you like, but you're actually going to take a step out at about a 45 degree angle, slowly bringing your leg back in. And these usually you can do walking. So you could take like 10 steps forward and 10 steps back. And again, the resistance, you're really gonna feel all throughout your hip. So the front, the side, and the back of the hip are all gonna be utilized with the monster walks. All right. So those are the ones that I have. And obviously there's so many exercises. There's so many things that you can, you can do for your knees, for your body. Um, these are just some of my favorites that are just easy, no matter where you're at. If you're at home, if you live on the road, you can do these anywhere. Bands are cheap. They're easy to carry with you, which make them a great resource and tool to have. The biggest thing with exercising is consistency. Consistency is key to get results. With a good strength program, you can decrease your risk of injury, but it never... It never you know, eliminates injury. This injuries can still happen, but it can really decrease your risk. And being consistent is really the most important thing when it comes to strength training. Um, with that, I'm also doing a like free 15 minute knee knee assessments. And I have four four reliable tests that have been used in research and with normative data that we can compare to. And you just set up like a 15 minute appointment with me. And then I run you through it for your left and your right knee. So, because we also want, we don't want your left and right knee to be too far apart. It's normal to have small differences between our left and right side, our dominant or non-dominant side. But when we have really big differences between our, our two sides, that can, that can put us at greater likelihood for injury on either our strong or our weaker side. So... Any questions for me? Nothing? Sign me up for a new test. I can, I'll send you guys the link if you want to sign up for, for a knee assessment. And so if you can, if you can paste that, can you paste that link in the chat? 
Yeah. Right? And just so everybody knows, um, those of you who put your email in the chat, there will be a transcript of this that I'll send to Zoe. So um, she'll get that. But also um, with this link that is going in there, also feel free to reach out to Zoe directly. Um, we do have a question. How frequent would you say for these workouts? Um, so strength training, I recommend two times a week. And I mean, two times a week for 30 minutes can make such a big difference on your strength overall. Um, I, I would really recommend doing that. And also if you're looking for more advice or if you want more one-on-one -on -one training, I, I do write programs for people. So I, I am a physical therapist, but my, my undergrad was in exercise science. Um, and then I went to grad school for physical therapy. So I, I know both sides of the training and then also the recovery side. So if you're looking for, um, for either recovery information or advice, or if you're looking for training rehab, I do write programs for people too. So I, some people love to build their own programs and I like, I hope you take all these resources and apply them. But if you want something more structured or want more advice, I'd be happy to work with you and um, write a program spe specifically for you, your limitations, and what your goals are too. Um, we have a question up a little bit higher. Um, how long should you stay in that zone one? Um, how long will depend on what you're training for, the length of time. I do, I personally, it, and it, it depends on your time, right? So time is a very valuable thing. And depending on where you are in your life, sometimes you have a lot of it and you have lots of time to work out. And sometimes it means that you're trying really hard to fit in small workouts throughout your week. So how many zone one workouts in a week? Well, it depends, which of course is the answer everyone hates, but we get a lot because it really is person dependent for myself. Personally, I try to do one long zone one, um, run, or I do a, either a trail run or a weighted hike. And I do that a long one. So if I do a trail run, it'll usually be between five and seven miles. And then, um, I, or I do a weighted hike and that I go for more verts. So I try to get like either 1500 to two, 2000 feet of vert, um, with, uh, like 40 to 50 pound pack. And, um, so like, that's where I am in my training and in my, in my program. And then I'll do one shorter zone one, but also it's good to train some of those other zones, other zones too. I didn't touch on it as much today because there's never enough time. <laughs> um, and so I, I do a little bit of zone one work and then I also work on some anaerobic training as well. And um, for those of you who are curious, um, Zoe is based in um, Susanville um, and spends time at uh, Lake Tahoe, down in Reno, and down the east side of the Sierra. So um, definitely can connect with her in person there. And we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, Zoe, were you able to put the link in the chat? Yes. Oh, wait, no, it went to a direct message. So yeah, can you share that with everyone? There we yeah, go. Yeah, we'll get that in there. There we go. So click on that link and you'll have Zoe's contact information. You also can book the appointment for the 15 minute knee test. Um, I just want to say, Zoe, thank you so much. I am, everyone knows I am not an exerciser. I am a riding bikes and snowboarding and yoga person. And so I appreciate you getting me out of my chair um, <laughs> and doing that tonight. I'm definitely going to get some bands. I'm pumped on that. And I wanna thank all of you for taking your time out of your day, out of your evening to be with us here tonight. Um, if there's ever other topics or things that you would like to know about, definitely feel free to reach out to us on the clubhouse. That's the best place to get in touch with anybody here. And we will post um, the notes from this and the recording. Um, I'll probably get to that ideally by the end of the week or maybe Monday, depending on how things go tomorrow. Who knows? It's a new day. Um, Thanks everyone. Zoe, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. All, yeah, my pleasure. Hope to see everybody again next month. And Zoe, let's um let's go down to Mammoth and make some turns. I would love that. Yeah, let's set something up for sure. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Bye everyone. Have a great night. Thank bye. you. <laughs> Perfect. Bye everyone.